M S W Media. Welcome to Teacher Quit Talk. I'm Miss Redacted. And I'm Mrs. Frazzled. Every week we explore the teacher exodus to find out what, if anything, could get these educators back in the classroom. We've all had our moments where we thought, what the hell am I doing here? From burnout to bureaucracy to soul-sucking stressors and creative dead ends. From recognizing when it was time to go to navigating feelings of guilt and regret afterwards, we're here to cut out the gaslighting and get real about what it means to leave teaching. We've got insights from former teachers from all over the country who have seen it all. So get ready to be disturbed. Join us on Teacher Quit talk to laugh through the pain of the U.S. education system. We'll see you there. The rule of law is not just some lawyer's turn of phrase. It is the very foundation of our democracy. The essence of the rule of law is that like cases are treated alike. That there not be one rule for Democrats and another for Republicans One rule for the powerful, another for the powerless, one rule for the rich, and another for the poor, or different rules depending upon one's race or ethnicity. To serve as attorney general at this critical time is a calling I am honored and eager to answer. So yeah, now it's clean up on aisle 45 time. And for a long while yet, it is going to be clean up on aisle 45. Hello, everyone. Welcome all to Clean Up on Aisle 45. I'm your host, Allison Gill. Andrew Torres is out this week, but joining me today is Morgan Stringer. Morgan, thanks for filling in today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, I'm really excited to, to I'm, it's, first of all, this is the first time we've met, so I'm excited. But I listened to the last show that you were on. And it was awesome. So I'm excited to do this with you. Thanks. Likewise. Now, we, we do have a great show, but first we want to thank our new patrons. So let's welcome Rakesh Patel, David Nason, and the Royal Society for the Prevention of Birds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can sign up for as little as a buck a show at patreon.com slash aisle45pod. That's A-I-S-L-E, 45-P-O-D. And you can uh, come up with a name like the Royal Society for the Prevention of Birds. <laughs> and thanks to everyone for supporting us and keeping this show going. We really appreciate it. Uh, all right. We have a lot of news in cleanup land today. Morgan, what's our first story? A story near and dear to my heart. So first up today is news from the EPA with Biden administration issuing a new rule that would curb toxic wastewater from coal plants. Oh, awesome. That is good news. Um, what what are some of the provisions of, of this new rule? So the EPA announced last week that it's setting stricter guidelines for how coal-fired power plants dispose of wastewater that's full of arsenic, lead, and mercury. So this is a major source of toxic water pollution in rivers, lakes, and streams near electric generators all across the country, from Wyoming to Pennsylvania. Hmm. Now, I'm, I'm assuming, I'm just going to take a stab here, the Trump administration lifted those regulations? <laughs> you would be correct. That is exactly <laughs> right. How did you guess? So with this new rule, the Biden administration will be undoing one of the Trump administration's biggest regulatory rollbacks when the weekend rules force many coal plants to treat wastewater with modern filtration methods and other technology before it reached waterways that provide drinking water for thousands of Americans and habitats and that kind of thing. So Rakita Fox, the EPA's top water official, said in an interview last Monday, quote, what we found is that the Trump administration's 2020 rule really is lacking. We think that we can do better when it comes to reducing water pollution from coal power plants. I guarantee you 100 uh, percent, Ms. Fox, that you can do better. Uh, and this isn't just about fixing what Trump broke, though, is it? No. This is just one example of how Biden's EPA is grappling with decades of neglect on water issues under both Democratic and Republican presidents as it pushes for billions of dollars from Congress to replace lead pipes and outdated sewage systems. And believe me, I know all about this as somebody who did work in water law and policy. So I have lots of notes and suggestions. <laughs> I, yeah, I want to hear that. I, I, and I also hear a lot of environmentalists and activists are kind of displeased with with this because of how long it's going to take to fix this. But it's there's not much to do about it. Right. Yes. So, of course, with this, it's you know, you, you do. It is kind of like pulling teeth sometimes to get a regulatory authority to act or, you know, roll back and 
sometimes that, that can be very frustrating, especially with the length of the process. So the EPA will not try to revert immediately to the stricter standards that were set under President Barack Obama in 2015. So this is going to allow that weaker Trump era rule to remain in effect. So that means many coal plants are going to be allowed to send polluted wastewater into rivers and streams for several more years while the agency writes these new regulations. The EPA expects to propose new requirements on power plants wastewater by next fall with a finalized rule expected by the end of Biden's term at the latest. And that's just how the regulatory process goes. Oh, well, well, why didn't um, the Biden administration just ask a federal appeals court to strike down the rule or file an injunction or something? Well, the Biden EPA saw a legal risk in asking the court to pull the Trump administration's rule because if these new rules weren't in place, then that could force us to revert back to even more outdated pollution standards from four decades ago, which would basically be back to river catching on fire in Cleveland type regulations. Mm. Uh, which I'm familiar with. Yeah, <laughs> I'm familiar with that, having grown up in Akron, Ohio. Yeah. And, I, you know, I mean, it seems like, OK, six and one half dozen. Right. If we if we try to put put back Obama, Obama's regulations, Obama air regulations, or if we try to get an injunction in the court, the whole thing could be lifted and go back to 1983. Uh, and then, you know, we're all river on fire. But I mean, a, a ton of coal plants have already asked to lock in permits under these lax Trump rules, including the Cumberland Fossil Plant in Tennessee, which is one of the largest coal fired plants in the country. And it's just upstream from the Cross Creek's National Wildlife Refugee. And it seems like a lot of polluters are happy that the Trump era rules will remain in effect for the next few few years. This doesn't seem like there's much we can do about it. Yeah, it, it's really disappointing. And it, in you know, it, it does it's bad. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, you, you know, you're you're absolutely right. There isn't much that we can do about it that wouldn't put the whole scheme in jeopardy. So Katie Sweeney, the executive vice president at the National Mining Association, so we can guess what side she's on, said, mm-hmm. well, disappointed that the new administration has decided to reconsider the 2020 rule. We look forward to engaging with the EPA. <laughs> which is a pretty PR lawyer statement. Um, Mm -hmm. So in power companies, they they are hoping to have a role as the EPA is shaping these new rules. Yeah, well, it appears that this new EPA isn't interested in having their science shaped by the fossil fuel industry, uh, as we've heard from other sort of previous uh, episodes on Clean Up on All 45 when we talked about EPA making changes. So hopefully they won't give them too big a seat at the table, if any. And uh, if we finally get these rules in place, though, near the end of the term, we'd better hope we're able to elect another Democrat to keep them in place, as I'm sure a Republican would just roll them back again. Yes. And it goes to show that the damage caused by the Trump administration is not so easily fixed, especially in this regulatory scheme. So we need new rules which take time. And if they aren't in place, we can't veto the old rules or we're going to be stuck with the really old rules. Yeah, well, Unraveling what Trump did is is certainly legally tricky and sometimes, you know, takes a lot of time. But, you know, in a new piece in The Atlantic, though, we have made a lot of headway. And uh, I want to talk about that a little bit in this new piece. But we have to take a quick break. So we'll be right back after that to discuss The Atlantic piece uh, in just a moment. So stay with us. I'm Greg Oliar, and this is Prevail. Дамы и господа, это Prevail. И ваш ведущий... There's a goal here, which is to make sure that Vladimir Putin not only stays in power, but that they're allowed to continue stealing. When you look at Brexit and you say, what what might have also happened when Leah was being interrogated? Sort of like Brexit. (laughs) A bunch of confused people following orders, really having no idea what they were doing. Tax avoidance on that level is only serving the interests, frankly, of a lot of mobsters and corrupt governments. The inherent question is, is Maria Butina a spy? And Maria Butina was in charge of espionage. So that's a difficult place to start to begin with. Those intangibles that those people want to have, we can't take advantage of that in dealing with Russia and China and Iran. If we can't do that, then you know what? Maybe we don't deserve to continue. Prevail with Greg Oliar every Friday. Welcome back to Clean Up on Aisle 45. I'm Morgan Stringer. Allison, what's the gist of a piece in The Atlantic you were talking about before the break? Ah, well, Olga Kazan sums it up like this. She's the author here. She says the Trump administration desperately wanted to cut government benefits and it had outside help to do so, but very few of its new rules held up. And she's talking about 
more than just the sweeping changes we've seen at the EPA. She begins by talking about how Trump's weak grasp on the regulatory process, which you're very familiar with, but he had such a weak grasp on it, luckily, and that put many of his policies in peril from the jump. Exactly. The Muslim ban was actually a great example of that. And according to The Atlantic, and as most of us already know, that policy was enacted hastily, challenged repeatedly, and ultimately was undone. Much like his proposed changes to the census, the methane emissions rule, and changes to payday lending, his incompetence has allowed his successor and even challengers in court during his administration to block or undo a lot of his policy. But as we discussed before, sometimes not enough. Right. Or that, you know, we, we have these legal trickery things that can be difficult. Um, and, and that's but, you know, the the fact that he was just so dumb at policy is highlighted in this article, uh, as is the diversity of Trump's failures. <laughs> he seems to uh, or seemed to underestimate the difficulty of changing government policy. No surprise, since he has absolutely zero government experience. And those of us who've worked in the government were all sort of raising our eyebrows at the announcement of these changes. Like, you can't just do that, bro. <laughs> Um, But check out some of these statistics. As of April, of the 259 regulations, guidance documents, and agency memoranda it issued that were challenged in court, of the 259, 200, or 77%, failed, according to a tracker from the Institute for Policy Integrity. That's a think tank at New York University that researches regulation policy, regulatory policy. A typical administration loses more like 30% of the time. (laughs) This kind of reminds me of a retention rate of his cabinet and staff. I <laughs> know, revolving door, right? The Scaramucci's. Uh, and while part of the reason so many of his policies have failed is because he was a one term president, you know, and we could just undo them when he was gone, a huge number of his rules were struck down by courts while he was still there because the Trump administration simply had no clue what it was doing. And it flubbed a lot of the wonky details that one really has to pay attention to for policy to stick. Yeah, and one example of that um, that's highlighted here is the food stamp debacle. So the Department of Agriculture, the USDA, controls the food stamp program, otherwise known as SNAP. And this provides free food to 38 million mostly poor Americans. Almost as soon as Trump was elected, the department, led by former governor uh, of Georgia, Sonny Perdue, he set about tightening eligibility for the program, because of course he did. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's what he does on the weekends. Uh, and, and the Trump team worked with a lot of outside special interest groups on this project and many other projects across agencies, we, as we know and as we've read. Uh, but, you know, for, for this, they worked with special outside special interest groups. And the, the USDA implemented many of their suggestions, or at least tried to, because in October 2020, Judge Beryl Howell, one of my favorite humans, struck down the rule that would have kicked an estimated 700,000 able-bodied adults without dependence off of the program. She says, quote, the agency has been icily silent about how many recipients would have been denied SNAP benefits had the changes sought in the final rule been in effect while the pandemic rapidly spread across the country. Exactly. And when Biden took over, he withdrew the eligibility proposals and then actually increased food stamp benefits for 25 million people. Susan Yaki, a policy expert at the University of Wisconsin, says that normally if a controversial new rule ends up in court, the agency usually wins. Now, there's some legal issues about that, such as the Chevron deference legal doctrine and, you know, reasons why this ag- the agency will usually win. But despite that, not so with the Trump administration. Yeah, yeah. They lost 70 percent of the time. Usually we win 70 percent of the time. And, and I, you know, I think that's something to be thankful for. Um, so they lost a lot. Uh, mostly because there was no like second or third level thinking. I, I noticed this a lot throughout the administration, and I'm sure you did too, that they would want something, but they wouldn't think about the ramifications down the line or how it would impact either negatively or positively other things that they hadn't didn't just didn't have the foresight to consider. Um, particularly with the food stamps thing, they didn't include the negative considerations of the decision, such as the impact on free school lunches, nor did they effectively describe the positive benefits. They just did stuff. And the court said, sorry, Charlie, you need reasons and, and, and analysis. And, you know, I'm reminded of the citizenship question fight in the courts. And I'm, I'm also thinking about parks and recreation, you know, where, where everything just ended up in an environmental study. Yes. <laughs> in the town hall meetings. Yes. And yeah, it's like no, nobody was doing any long term 
thinking whatsoever. It was just snap decisions, do it now, which, you know, you can see in Trump's temperament, you can see in just the way he ran the administration, his staffing, as you know, we joked about, but it does reflect truly in his policy. And this happened with a lot of environmental rules as well. Um, So yeah, while the Trump administration being full of idiots was harmful, it certainly did have its advantages for us. And also to the rest of us, the failure of these policies may look like the system is working. But we all know that this is not going to be the last time Republicans attempt to cut benefits or roll back regulations, and the next Republican in office may not be as dumb. Yeah, it would be real hard, actually, I think, for (laughs) for anyone to be as dumb. Uh, And I've noticed a lot of Republicans as of late trying to reframe language around a lot of our benefits programs, Uh, like recently Elise Stefanik. Uh, who used to not be a Trump person, but then I know she got swept up in the in the sedition caucus. She she praised Medicare, but then condemned left wing socialism as the boogeyman that wants to take it away from you. Uh, and they they know they have no ideas, right? So they're reframing the language around the good ideas to make them seem bad. It's like this reflexive control. It's as old. It's an old Russian trick that 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 I think uh, you know they've been doing for a century, and now they're trying to do it here, like with the word collusion, for example, during the Mueller investigation, which isn't even a legal term of art. Like it had, <laughs> it didn't even apply, but somehow that became the thing. Yeah, you you can't prove collusion because it's not a legal term. Therefore, there was no collusion. It's like, yeah, no. So yeah, this also follows that often cited rule that once there is an entitlement that is normalized, then it is nearly impossible to then take away that entitlement. But that's why it's so important to get these voting rights up to shore and keep Democrats in office because of this reframing and this language that they are doing um, around these entitlements and benefits also combined with them then stripping down those entitlements and benefits down to the bare bones. Yeah, and they tried to do that uh, in the 2020 election, saying Biden wanted to get rid of Social Security. He tried to cut Social Security one time. Remember, remember, and he wants to segregate schools. And you know, and it was just, you know, just the language that they use. Like, you know, when we've talked about this on the show, Andrew and I, and I've talked about it on my other shows. The purpose for a Republican to get into government is to destroy the government from within. They don't want to build anything or create anything or have any ideas. They hate the government and they don't want it to work. So they get in there you know, throw their shoes in the wheels and then say, look, government sucks. And, you know, the rest of us are like, (laughs) it's because you're actively trying to ruin it. And it 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 just never ceases to amaze me that how many people fall fall for that rhetoric. Oh, yeah. It reminds me of that uh, meme from Community of the guy in the hot dog costume saying, we're all trying to find the guy who did this. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. And and I mean, I. That I and I we could go on for a long time about voting rights um, and why we need to shore those up, uh, because, I mean, we're looking at a situation where somebody like maybe a Ron DeSantis or if Donald Trump isn't indicted and runs again or if he is indicted and runs again. I don't know what the rules on that are. I don't think that I think you can. Uh, I think you only have to be 35 and have lived in the country for seven years and be a natural citizen. But. Um, that's, that's what concerns me the most. And then, like you said, looking down the line at possibly smarter, like ideologues and demagogues, like a Josh Hawley, uh, I don't know if he's much smarter he is, but he's not as dumb as Trump. Yeah. And that's what we need to watch out for. Hmm. Yeah. So let's keep screaming about voting rights. Keep screaming about the filibuster. Uh, And we're going to do the third segment here after this break. And we don't have any comings and goings to report this week. So we're going to bank them for next week. But I do want to talk a little bit about the Justice Department and everything it did last week. So we'll do that right after this break. Season two of Swing Left's How We Win is here. We have an incredible opportunity to fight for our democracy. We don't agonize. We organize. And we've got a lot of work to do. Subscribe right now on Apple and everywhere you get your pods for insight, action, and your reasons for hope. I'm Steve Pearson. And I'm Mariah Craven. And And this this is season season two of How We We Win. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Clean Up on Aisle 45. I'm here with Morgan Stinger. And Andrew will be back next week with the robust comings and goings segment. But right now... I wanted to discuss some of the stellar moves, what I consider stellar moves, made by the Justice Department last week, which should bring a smile to many of those who were concerned 
that Merrick Garland was not the man for the job. He was just going to move forward, quote unquote, in the interest of putting the whole Trump thing behind us. Um, Morgan, let's talk about the executive privilege letter, the Trump tax returns, the lawsuit against the Texas governor and the Department of Justice, Justice handing over those notes from Donahue, which are usually considered deliberative or otherwise privileged, namely, like I said, the Richard Donahue notes from that Trump call to former acting attorney general Jeff Rosen. Yes. So Merrick Garland and friends have been booked and busy lately. So there is a lot going on with the Department of Justice. So let's talk about first the Texas lawsuit and then we'll get into the Trump of it all. So what has Gregory Abbott gotten himself into this time? Well, uh, this time, uh, you know, as as if being no, it was Paxton who's indicted. Right. Or is Abbott indicted, too? No, it's it's Paxton, the attorney (laughs) general. Right. Yeah. The the top cop. Right. July 28th, Abbott issued an executive order. So this is a few days. This is last week. Uh, Abbott issued an executive order allowing the Texas Department of Public Safety troopers to reroute civilian vehicles back to their origin point or point of entry or seize the vehicles if the police suspect the driver is transporting migrants who might have COVID. So... Yeah, I have a lot of issues with this, as people might expect. First of all, this is so hypocritical of a governor who literally has not cared a single bit about the spread of COVID-19 before. Um, You know, he's been part of that whole, you know, COVID, you know, I'm going to downplay it and act like, you know, it's either a hoax or people are blowing it out of proportion. Second, it is just allowing the police to racially profile people and pull them over and then do God knows what. Then third, it's super racist in that it's also blaming the pandemic on immigrants with this whole immigrants carry diseases trope that we have seen in this country for centuries. And this is just a way for police to deport people, steal their cars, harass people, and basically a way for Abbott to throw red meat to his base for potential, you know, runnings in the future. So what is Merrick Garland of a DOJ doing about this and on what grounds are they suing? All right. So this is pretty cool. Uh, And before I get into that, you know, I just kind of want to remind everybody, and you remember this, it was a few months ago when uh, Abbott was about to make a rule that you couldn't have a mask mandate in Texas. He was about to mandate, a man. he he was going to put a mandate out saying we don't like mandates. And uh, then, and then like the next day said uh, that the immigrants are bringing COVID uh, across the border. This has been their messaging. They've been ramping it up for a while, right? Um, And so what, the DOJ is doing? Why are they suing? Merrick Garland sent a letter to the governor, Abbott, the day before, (laughs) the day before the Department of Justice filed suit. And the suit makes good on the threat in the letter. And it mirrors the letter, which was what I was kind of hoping they would do with the Arizona uh, fraud it, but they haven't yet. But anyway, uh, it mirrors the letter. Essentially, this executive order interferes with the federal government's authority to enforce and enact immigration laws. And it totally does. It's black and white. It does. Immigration is under the federal government's authority. It's their jurisdiction. And Greg Abbott is usurping that. So Gregory Abbott's response that Biden is actually the one creating the constitutional crisis between the federal government and Texas is actually incorrect. Shocker. So what do you think this means for a future? Do you think this is just Abbott posturing as sort of an enemy of Biden for his own future political ambitions? Yeah, I mean, this is clearly more xenophobia. It's more, like you said, red meat for the base, riling up fear of immigrants, the old trope that immigrants bring disease. They've been saying it for a while now. They've been every time they lift COVID restrictions or take away masks or downplay the uh, the the virus or or the pandemic or say that vaccines are stupid. Every time they do that, they come right back around and say immigrants are bringing COVID across uh, across our borders, and it's absolutely untrue. And then they go down for these fake photo ops in boats. You see Ted Cruz in a vest oh God. <laughs> uh, down there on the river, and they're like, "Look, we're patrolling the river," and 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 here, look, there's a picture of a coyote smuggling. Uh, aliens and it's this guy in a boat like waving like a like a smuggler is going to be like sure and take my picture uh it's just absolutely ridiculous it's it's ginning up false xenophobic fear-mongering much like the caravan threats that we saw in 2018 it's just going to keep going and it's going to get louder and stronger and i think as this delta variant spreads we're going to see a lot of blame especially in southern states put on immigration 
I've I've noticed that, you know, especially recently, the Republican governors, I don't know what memo they got. I would definitely like to see it. But I noticed they stopped kind of saying, oh, the pandemic's not real or it's being overplayed. And they kind of reversed onto, you know, indicating in some statements even to say, you know, go get vaccines. And I'm wondering if this is also part of that, because they know they can't say, oh, well, immigrants are spreading the Delta variant, but then also saying the Delta variant's not a big deal. But as we've seen, they have no problem with doing hypocritical messaging in the past. So, well, on from a terrible governor onto a terrible former president. So let's talk about this executive privilege letter. I know that executive privilege was thrown around a lot, particularly in the Trump administration. So what does this executive privilege letter from the DOJ relate to? Yeah, despite Trump's overutilization of the words executive privilege, it does actually exist. Uh, And this relates to the January 6th committee. The Department of Justice has notified former government officials that it would not be appropriate to assert executive privilege with respect to communications with former President Trump and his advisors and staff on matters related to the committee's proposed interviews. And that's according to a person who has read the letter from the department, uh, official Bradley Weisenheimer. That's the department official who wrote this letter. And this is reporting from NPR's Brian Naylor and Kerry Johnson. Yeah, so according to the Washington Post, though, there must be additional authorization given specifically to the committee. And then once that is given, then they can compel Trump officials to testify and they cannot then claim, oh, every conversation I ever had with Trump is executive privilege. They won't be able to claim that at all. So do you think that it's likely that the DOJ will then give the committee authorization? Yeah, well, the way that this um, executive privilege um, it, you know, memo was written, particularly with regards to uh, the one six committee. And then again, with former Trump Department of Justice officials, like former acting attorney general Jeffrey Rosen, and Richard Donahue's chief of staff, it was it was kind of it wasn't like, you must give the testimony. It was, hey, you're free to give unfettered testimony, which kind of leads me to believe that there have already been discussions within the department with Jeffrey Rosen, and Richard Donahue and other officials that these letters were sent to, that they might be agreeable to to testify to this committee and to uh, another Senate committee about possible election interference, you know, with with regard to that Trump call to Rosen, where he said, uh, hey, you don't even have to do anything. Just say the investigation or that the election was corrupt and leave the rest to me and my Republican friends in Congress, you know. Uh, And so that, to me, it, it says a couple of things. First of all, it says that an institutionalist like Merrick Garland isn't going to exert or in, or invoke executive privilege is, is a big deal. But, you know, Merrick Garland said in the letter, or excuse me, Weisheimer said in the letter, hey, this is unprecedented. This is a, a, an attack on the Capitol. Uh, and this is, you know, a, a interference in our uh, free and fair elections. So, you know, we, we kind of can't, we, we almost don't want to. And so I feel like Everyone's sort of in agreement on here. So if there needs to be a special authorization for for these folks to testify uh, to any committee in Congress, Senate or the House, that that they'll be given authorization. Okay, so if this authorization is given, then what is the likelihood of any subpoenas that have been issued being enforced? Because Congress does not have a great track record with enforcing them. And I checked and they have actually not enforced their arrest and detain authority since 1927. Yeah, I don't think they'll invoke inherent contempt. Uh, I I wish they would. I wish they'd throw somebody in prison or fine them if they didn't, um, you know, comply with the subpoena. But again, I think we've got friendlies and unfriendlies, right? So if the 1-6 Commission asks for uh, Jim Jordan, McCarthy, Trump, Rudy Giuliani, uh, John Jr., no no way he's coming in. They're going to fight that and it's going to go to court. But I think the difference between now and back then is that this Department of Justice is not going to be fighting on behalf of these people who don't want to testify. So it might go faster, um, but who knows? Uh, I think the main thing we should be looking from the 1-6 committee, though, isn't necessarily testimony, uh, unless it's from friendlies, but more the documentary evidence, the phone logs of Jim Jordan, for example, uh, things that... that, um, that the committee can request from the Department of Justice that the Department of Justice will most likely hand over because they signaled in that executive privilege letter, this is unprecedented and we're not going to 
basically we're not going to block any of this stuff from from coming out. It needs to be investigated. It needs to be known. Uh, I'm personally more vested in the criminal investigation of the insurrection at the Department of Justice. Uh, but we'll see what this committee comes up with. But yeah, those subpoenas will just languish in court just like they did before, I, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah I, I saw that they, there is not, I know that there's not a good track record, but I, when I looked into like, when's the last time they actually had somebody arrested, I was shocked. I was like, 1927, goodness. Um, so yeah, let's talk more about these notes specifically, um, namely the Richard Donahue notes of a Trump call to former acting attorney general, Jeffrey Rosen. So what are these notes about? All right. So these are, these are crazy. Uh, there were notes taken during a December 27 phone call. That's 10 days before the insurrection where Trump actually pressured the acting attorney general, Jeffrey Rosen, and his deputy, Richard Donahue. Oh, I thought he was his chief staff deputy. That's right. To say just to say there was massive voter fraud, which the Department of Justice did not find. And Bill Barr had just gotten out of there, you know, because he was trying to get Bill Barr to say the same thing. And Barr actually came out and said, there's no there's none. Uh, although. I'm not letting Barr off the hook that easy because for months and months leading up to that, he was like, mail-in voting is rife with fraud. There can be all sorts of problems. So he, you know, he was, he contributed to this problem too. But Donahue told Trump that the Department of Justice could not overturn the election and we aren't going to do that. And we're not going to say the election was corrupt because we haven't found any evidence of that. And Trump said that he knew that and that, hey, quote, just like I said, just say the election was corrupt and leave the rest to me. and congressional Republicans, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what these notes say. And, and this is, uh, you know, I have to reiterate this, that the Department of Justice handed these over um, really kind of speaks volumes to Merrick Garland's not taking your shit. I, I mean, yeah, I would say so. And I mean, the, yeah, that's that's how a mobster talks, you know, just say the election was corrupt and leave the rest to me and my buddies. And mm. yeah, and the fact that he knew that he had allies in Congress is certainly chilling as well. And speaking of those allies, I noticed that Jim Jordan, the representative from Ohio and representative Scott Perry of Pennsylvania and Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin um, were also mentioned specifically by name. And these are um, particularly with Senator Johnson. Trump said, he's, oh, he's a guy that can get to the bottom of things. <laughs> and I recall also as an Ole Miss alum, you know, this was particularly interesting to me, was that, you know, Tommy Tuberville received a call from Trump. That, and we all know about that call. So I would be very interested to know more about that. And I'm positive <laughs> that our other usual suspects uh, played a role as well. So what else do these notes tell us? Well, they tell us a lot, right? They, first of all, they tell us that Trump and his camp tried to get the Department of Justice to say the election was fraudulent. And there were discussions of voting conspiracy theories, frustration that the Supreme Court would not invalidate the election, uh, and Trump criticizing the Department of Justice for not fighting hard enough for him. Like, remember the old, where's my Roy Cohn? And getting <laughs> mad at Sessions for recusing from the Mueller investigation, and now mad at Barr for leaving him hanging on the election stuff. And Trump said, quote, the people saying that the election isn't corrupt are corrupt. And then Trump told the Department of Justice to act because there wasn't much time left. Yeah, that's very damning documentary evidence, if I would <laughs> say so myself. Act yeah. because there's not yeah. much time. And I talked and I talked to uh, Andy McCabe about this. And he was like, these contemporary, these kinds of contemporaneous notes, by the way, when you're that high up in the Department of Justice, you take the notes and they take them from you and they lock them up. And those were your notes and thoughts at the time are one of the strongest pieces of documentary evidence you can have. Uh, and, and it's, and, you know, it, we, we saw it in the Zelensky call. It was the same thing. Hey, you don't have to do an investigation. Just say you're doing an investigation. Just announce it. And then I'll release your money. You know, do, do us a favor, though. It's, it's just almost the exact same call. And again, it just shows, again, example, example after example of Trump believing basically that the government works for him and not the country. It's, you know, it's my Department of Justice that exists to keep me in power kind of mentality. So one mm -hmm. of the notes which I had to laugh at was Trump saying that thousands of people were calling their attorney generals, which mm -hmm. big if true, but... <laughs> I mean, even if true, that's because Trump and Giuliani and Sid, friend Sidney Powell and Lynn Wood were out here touting out a bunch of conspiracy theories. So I'm sure that there were Trump supporters probably calling their attorney generals trying to say, oh, the election was fraudulent with zero evidence. But this note particularly made me cackle. 
where uh, Trump apparently said, quote, you guys may not be following the internet the way that I do, which I found relatable um, because I'll be talking about something that happened on Twitter and nobody will have any idea what I'm talking about. (laughs) Uh, So I was like, I kind of relate to this. But again, it shows Trump was far too online in the worst ways. So I guess tell us why were these notes given to the committee in the first place? Because I know that they were privileged. Yeah, they 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 are totally privileged, right? This is deliberative process. It's executive privilege. They are deliberating with the executive about things, and we generally don't want these turned over. And Merrick Garland, an institutionalist, generally doesn't want these turned over. But I do I do have to note though, you were ma- you were talking about the thousands of people calling their attorneys general. Uh, that reminds me. Do you remember? When Trump said when he fired Comey, he's like, everyone at the FBI hated him. I got calls all the time from everyone in the FBI saying that they're glad that I fired him. And then Sarah Huckabeast went out on the podium as the press as the press secretary and said, yeah, many people at the FBI didn't like Comey. A lot of people didn't like Comey. And then she got caught lying because Mueller asked her about that. And she admitted to Mueller because she was under oath at that point. She wasn't standing behind the press secretary podium. She was under fucking oath. She's like. Oh, yeah, no, I was that wasn't correct. <laughs> or just yeah, when Trump would be like a, a hundred Marines came up to me and with tears in their eyes and said, thank you, sir, for, you know, taking the country back. And yeah, it's always, you know, it's always the most people. They're all concerned. They all love them. You know, they're all they hate his enemy. They just so happen to all hate his enemies and love him so much. So, yeah. And I read it on the Internet and I heard it. You know, people have said many people uh, are tweeting. (laughs) Many people have said and I have many meetings and many calls. Yeah. Uh, But back to these notes, because, you know, you were just mentioning that you generally these are privileged notes, but they they were turned over, even though, uh, as you as you noted, they're usually privileged because this is going uh, to that scrutiny of Trump's efforts to overturn the election, which I was talking about that a minute ago. Right. Executive privilege is supposed to benefit the country, not the president as an individual. So Trump's personal agenda is not covered by executive privilege. The Biden Department of Justice instructed Rosen, Donahue and others that they could provide that unrestricted testimony. Uh, And that's that executive privilege that, you know, that we were talking about earlier. So we'll see if they have anything to further add about this. But, you know, I have to tell you, even if (laughs) it's it's almost it reminds me of that crime fraud exception thing now. We don't obviously have any proof uh, that any of these things are crimes as of yet. I do think they need to be investigated as such. I talked to um, Barb McQuaid about that a couple of days ago because there, you know, there are a lot of federal crimes that that could have been committed here. But it's like just to avoid that whole thing, you know, they were like, um, you know, well, it's it can't be privileged because it's your personal agenda. I just love it, sort of. Sort of reminds me of the Mo Brooks, your language isn't protected because you were campaigning. That's what that's it. You were campaigning. <laughs> yeah. So we'll see what comes of that. I definitely will be interested in any testimony they have to offer or certainly any more documents that come out from this. Um, you know, I mean, Lord knows what will come out after seeing these kind of notes. Um, so more to come. OK, so let's switch gears here and talk about the tax returns. So these are also headed to Congress, support documentary evidence. But specifically, these are going to the Ways and Means Committee. So not this January 6th um, Insurrection Committee. What are they hoping to learn from these? Is it just I've seen reports that they're just seeing if they conform to tax law? Or do you think that there's other information that they're hoping to learn or that they might learn? Yeah, no, this particular subpoena for for these tax returns by Richie Neal of House Ways and Means was very specific with a narrow scope as defined in the courts the first time it went up to the Supreme Court and back. It took a couple of years. But they said, we need these tax returns. And even though Richie Neal, under this law, this 1926 law or whatever, he doesn't have to have a legislative purpose to ask for the tax returns. It's the IRS shall furnish them, right? But he had one and he defined it and he said, we're looking at that automatic uh, presidential tax audit program that we have. We think there's something weird that, that Trump's taxes somehow flew right through the, uh, the national presidential tax audit program that looks at the president and vice president's taxes. So he wants to assess the effectiveness of that particular program. 
And that was the only thing he was going to use them for. And so he, he wasn't trying to get these to look for crimes and sort through to make criminal referrals and do all that stuff. That doesn't mean he couldn't. But, you know, I mean, we've we've got other avenues. We've seen his taxes. We haven't personally actually seen his taxes, but we got a pretty good report from The New York Times last year and like this five part story that they released. Um, but, you know, I I think that. I think people are a little overly excited uh, about this, and I, I don't think they should be because, you know, even if House Ways and Means gets the taxes, they can't release them to the public. That was also in the court documents that these you have to promise to keep these a secret. And they're uh, ex- exempt from FOIA. And so, you know, I, I don't know. But uh, I know we're about to get into uh, the the idea that Trump is probably going to battle this. And, I, you know, I have to tell you, there is some late breaking news. Trump's lawyer has indicated that they will file to object to the release of the tax returns. And, and to be clear, it's an Office of Legal Counsel member from the Department of Justice that instructed the Treasury to make the IRS hand over the taxes to the Ways and Means Committee. And... We just learned seriously, like this is Monday afternoon, a couple minutes ago, that Trump's lawyers intend to to try to block that. Under what uh, pretense? I have no idea. Because I was going to ask, and I'm wondering if this means that they are literally about to be turned over to Congress, because according to that court order, Trump's lawyers get a 72 hour heads up before they are turned over to Congress. So I'm wondering if that 72 hour heads up had just been issued this evening. So does that 72 hour period, does that concern you? I know, as you said, you know, New York Times has a good idea of what's in these tax returns. Also, I know that the Manhattan District Attorney, Cyrus Vance Jr., he already has them, evidently. But do you think in that time, I guess, I guess we now know that Trump's lawyers are planning on delaying it. And do you foresee this being an issue? Mm, I I don't know, because I mean... They're gonna, I think they're going to try to block it. But that 72-hour clock started ticking when this decision was uh, issued in a status conference, I think, on Friday. And Trump had until Tuesday at midnight to answer. Uh, and his apparently, we've learned today on Monday, we record this on Monday, that he's going to be answering by tomorrow at midnight. Uh, but again, I don't know what law he's going to cite. He's got, he can't say executive privilege. He can't say, I mean, there's nothing. The law is very clear. They shall furnish the tax returns. Um, but, you know, the I think what you bring up is a, an important point with the Manhattan District Attorney, because they've had the tax returns for a long time now. Uh, and, and not necessarily the federal ones. They got they just got the federal ones from Mazars recently this year. But they've had the state tax returns for a couple of years and they might have gotten the federal tax returns when Deutsche Bank started handing over stuff to them two years ago. And now they've got a forensic auditing team. Uh, which is the same team that the Mueller investigation used, pouring through these documents and, and, and tax things. So even if House Ways and Means, if Trump didn't file to block and House Ways and Means got the taxes this week, we wouldn't be able to see them. And they would just be going through them to see if the presidential audit program is valid. Then they would be making recommendations to maybe make changes to the presidential audit program, perhaps requiring people to furnish their tax returns if they want to run for president or vice president. And then that would have to be voted on by the Senate. I don't think the Senate would pass that particularly. No. Um, and then that would kind of be the end of it. And if they did find crimes, they might be able to make criminal referrals to the Department of Justice. But I guarantee effing to you, or the Manhattan District Attorney, who, by the way, their 15 count indictment against Weisselberg and the Trump Organization mentioned the word federal 30 times. And so I'm pretty sure that the Manhattan District Attorney and the New York Attorney General Tish James, who's working in, you know, in concert with with Cy Vance, if they found federal crimes, I pretty much guarantee you they've already referred them over to the Department of Justice. So they've got a real big head start on this. Anything that comes out of the House Ways and Means Committee is going to take a couple of years. And even if it's anything, it's probably just recommendations to the presidential tax audit program, which would we have plenty of time to institute that by the next presidential election. Those are just my opinions, though. So I know you said that it's unlikely to um, leak from this uh, Ways and Means Committee, but and also we know that they have not leaked from a Manhattan district attorney. But as you said, you know, Ways and Means might, you know, refer them to other parties. You know, there could be there also could be a congressional staffer. Maybe that gets a peek at them and decides, you know, maybe the New York Times would like to, you know, have these. 
So how likely do you think it is that these tax returns do eventually leak? And, you know, when, do you think it'll be sooner rather than later? Yeah, I don't know. I, I really don't know because, you know, you're totally right. Stuff is way easier to leak out of congressional committees than it is out of, say, Cy Vance's grand jury. Um, that gr- Those grand jury secrecy rules are uber, you know, enforced. Uh, but Richie Neal in the House Ways and Means Committee in this particular case was very clear through court because one of Trump's concerns was you could totally damage me as president and risk national security uh, if my taxes got out and everyone knows Congress leaks like a sieve, which is probably one of the only true statements he ever said. Um, but they, you know, they said, no, we do not intend to release them. We do not intend to make them public. But yeah, somebody could always just slip them out there. And, you know, like I said, New York Times got a hold of uh, quite a few years. Remember, we found out last year he only paid $750 in taxes and then he carried forward all this stuff. And we saw this easement, conservation easement thing. And they gave a, they, we did, they, he, they didn't show us his tax returns, uh, but they certainly told us everything that was in them. And then, you know, we learned a lot about uh, some of the tax crimes in the speaking indictment um, that uh, came out of the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. So the, I think the way we're going to find out about these tax crimes and what's in these tax documents the first thing we're going to know is we're going to know about the crimes through speaking indictments, either through Manhattan District Attorney, New York Attorney General, or any federal referrals those offices make to the feds. I think that would be the first indication. And, and like I said, we've already seen some of these tax crimes, that tax fraud and tax evasion scheme in the 15 count indictment on Weisselberg and the Trump Organization, where they were you know, basically giving people bags of cash and, and writing a separate second set of books and you know, they they outlined it pretty, pretty huge detail, which they don't have to do, but they did. And I, so I think that's how we're going to hear about tax crimes. So do you think other than tax crimes, um, if there'll be anything else that happens with these tax returns, whether it comes from Ways and Means or through, um, you know, Manhattan, the Manhattan District Attorney or some other authority? Or do you think we're well, at the end aside, of the road here? Well, aside from, you know, state and federal tax crimes, uh, the uh, really amending the the policy on presidential tax returns. First of all, how well that audit program works. How did how the fuck did Trump's taxes get through the presidential audit program without raising any red flags? And if they did raise red flags, where were they stopped? Um, I mean, we know Trump was real excited to put in his own IRS commissioner and IRS general counsel who both, by the way, own Trump properties, Trump branded properties and, and make income off of them. So it's going to be interesting to see um, what else could possibly come out or result from these tax returns. But I certainly hope we get some some laws or, or policies written, um, something codified that either strengthens that presidential audit program or requires, you know, and states can always require presidents to have to release their tax returns to put them on the ballot. I, see, I think we're seeing a lot of that, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah. And, I, you know, you talked about the presidential audit um, process that goes there. And I recall, you know, during the 2016 election, he kept saying over and over, I'm under audit, I'm under audit. And so it's crazy. It's like, so you file a tax return as just a regular citizen and it gets held up forever. But you, you know, it goes through the presidential one and then all of a sudden it flies through no problems. Yeah, that's that's kind of, again, giant red flag right there. And of course, he wasn't under audit. Um, we would have known about it. And uh, <laughs> I do, it, it was just a it was just an excuse not to hand over his taxes because we know the real reason. And he argued it in court when Ways and Means was trying to get it is this will this will be irreparable harm to me. And, and national security. Uh, why? You know, gosh, why, Mr. President? You know, yeah. um, but something else everyone should cons- you know, consider as well is those tax returns aren't going to show federal or foreign financial entanglements. Right. Um, they'll show you where banks and stuff come from, but they aren't going to show you the meat. And the meat is is all of that. Those documents that um, Cy Vance got from Mazars and the New York Attorney General, the New York Attorney General's office has. So that's I think where the smoking guns are are in those accountants documents and 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 bringing in some accountants to testify to the grand jury. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be there's not going to be a line item that says a bunch of money paid by Vladimir Putin. <laughs> What's this? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, or like a a copy of microfiche of a check from Oleg Deripaska or something. Yeah, it's not going to happen. All right. Well, 
Yeah, so that's a whole bunch of stuff that the DOJ did right last week. It doesn't make up for the terrible E. Jean Carroll decision or the terrible Lafayette Square decision or the terrible oh, we won't release the second half of Bill Barr's memo decision. But at least it is showing willingness to um, not invoke executive privilege in, in things that have to do with election interference and the insurrection. And it shows that they aren't going to back people who instigated an attack on the Capitol uh, and that they're, you know, allowing for these normally privileged institutionalist privileged notes, deliberative process notes to be released to Congress when they ask for them. And I think that bodes well for the future of these investigations in Congress. Yes. And I do have to give a shout out to Benny Thompson from my home state, uh, chairing the January 6th insurrection committee. So um, Benny's doing good work there and I hope to see some something come out of it. Yeah. And he is doing excellent work there. And I love that the officer said, Hey, we would like it if you would please investigate the people who instigated this and funded it and incited it and not just the people who, you know, the, the people who hired the hitman, not just the hitman. So for sure. All right. Well, it's been so awesome talking to you. This has been amazing. Thank you so much for filling in for Andrew. Uh, I'll be gone next week. And so I think you'll be filling in for me next week. So it'll be you and Andrew. All right. I um, I am glad that you that I am the substitute co-host. <laughs> it is an honor. I, I have fun every time and learn so You're much. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, and I have to tell you, it, it's working with Andrew and his colleagues now that I'm that I've met you. I'm just so glad that like my little world is expanding to meet really new, interesting, intelligent people. And I, I hope I get to bend your ear sometime about policy, because that's something that I think is really, really fascinating. I worked at the Department of Veterans Affairs high up GS-14 when Trump got in and he said, all right, you need to give me three out of every five regulations you want to cancel. And we're like, it's the VA. What do you want us to cancel prime? Just pick they any three. <laughs> yeah. That's how policy's done. Just pick three you hate. Yeah, so we we literally had to sit there at tables with policies going, what can we not do? What can we throw away? And I mean, I get it. After a bureaucracy is in business for a couple hundred years, you start getting piles and piles and piles of regulations. But, you know, you you condense them, you consolidate them. You don't just nix them. Um, but anyway, I would love to bend you about that sometime. It's been really great meeting you. Everybody, thanks for listening to Clean Up on Aisle 45. Again, if you want to become a patron, go to patreon.com slash aisle 45 pod little it's just a buck an episode man and then i that's worth it to come up with a, a name for us to read on the air personally i would just pay a dollar to get to make that happen um but thank you any final thoughts before we get out of here morgan um no i i guess i have nothing to plug except for um if you want to find my insane musings um you can follow me on twitter um morgan l stringer that's the initial l and the handle is at mo string m-o-s-t-r-i-n-g Awesome. And on behalf of you, Morgan Stringer, I'm Allison Gill. This has been Clean Up on Aisle 45. We'll see you next week. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is written, researched, and produced by Allison Gill and Andrew Torres with editing by Molly Hockey. Our art and logo designer by Joelle Reeder and Moxie Design Studios, and our music is composed and performed by Adam Orr. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, visit mswmedia.com. Season four of How We Win is here. For the past four years, we've been making history in critical elections all over the country. And last year, we made history again by expanding our majority in the Senate, beating election-denying Republicans in crucial state house races, and fighting back a non-existent red wave. But the MAGA Republicans who plotted and pardoned the attempted overthrow of our government now control the House thanks to gerrymandered maps and repressive anti-voter laws. And the chaotic spectacle we've already seen shows us just how far they will go to seize power, dismantle our government, and take away our freedoms. So the official podcast of The Persistence is back with season four. There's so much more important work ahead of us to fight for equity, justice, and our very democracy itself. We'll take you behind the lines and inside the rooms where it happens with strategy and inspiration from progressive changemakers all over the country. And we'll dig deep into the weekly news that matters most 
and what you can do about it with messaging and communications expert, co-founder of Way to Win, and our new co-host, Jennifer Fernandez Ancona. So join Steve and I every Wednesday for your weekly dose of inspiration, action, and hope. I'm Steve Pearson. And I'm Jennifer Fernandez Ancona. And And this this is is How We Win. Win.